right, so I am here with Chad Husby and we're at Fairchild Garden. And this is something that we haven't seen before. I know we've done a number of tours at Fairchild, but Chad, you had mentioned your snake plant collection, which is this relatively new for you? This is very new. We just got really interested in it since about 2019 when uh, I was out on a Palm Society tour in California and one of the members gave me a piece of a very rare snake plant, a very rare Sansevieria, and it just clicked in my mind that there was more to these plants than I'd realized and decided that uh, it was time to work on starting a collection and got involved with the International Sansevieria Society and turned out that Turns out South Florida is really the only place in the continental U.S. where we can grow most of these, out, actually all of them probably, outdoors. Really, not even in like Arizona or anything like that? They can only grow a handful there because it gets too cold in most years. And Southern California too, because even though a lot of those areas don't freeze, there's many of these that are from Somalia and Kenya that don't like a lot of nights in the 40s or even in the 50s. And you know we rarely get those temperatures, so. It turns out that we can grow, you know, aside from Hawaii, we're the only place where we can really grow the entire genus. Well, I know they've rejiggered a lot of the species recently and they've done some more genetic analysis on them, but how many species do you venture that you have here? We've got about in the range of 50 right now, which is, um, you know, most of what of the species that are currently described, we're kind of focusing more on the species that are more desert types with cylindrical leaves, not the, as much the flat-leafed types, but we're uh, expanding into those more and more too. So. Well, one of the things that I learned in, in some of my readings is that the cylindrical types, they're not necessarily more closely related, that it seems like it's, it's been an evolutionary thing that has developed across many different time periods. Absolutely, yeah, the sense of areas are, um, you know, now they're considered to be part of the genus Dracaena by a lot of people. Although they do, they do actually hold together as a group in terms of the, what, the, what the DNA is telling us, but um, because that group is nested within the larger Dracaena group, there's a, a kind of a current rule that, that they won't name both groups, give both groups separate names, but not everybody abides by that rule and nor do we have to, so, <laughs> so I, I choose to continue to call them because we don't really have another good name to call this, this group right. that's very desert adapted and has some very unique characteristics that hold them together, like the fact that they, you can propagate them from leaves. Uh, it seems like you can't do that with any Dracaena. And they have these very thick desert adapted leaves. And some of them, you know, that have this creeping underground stem that is individual leaves that grow above ground. That's something you don't see in Dracaena either, so. One of the things that I, I saw is like, there was a patent filed for somebody who had crossed a Dracaena with a Sansevieria type. And what I would be curious is oftentimes when you do those intergeneric crosses, whether it actually can produce progeny after that. I have not seen any kind of paper on that, but have, have you at all? Because I think that would be a really true testament, like if they could interbreed together and actually produce viable progeny that also could then share pollen sources afterwards. Yeah, that would be fascinating. In fact, the thing is though, we, I don't even think we're even at that point because actually I have a plant of one of the uh, purported hybrids and it looks an awful lot like a Dracaena to me. I don't, ah. I haven't seen any sense of area characteristics in it, so. Interesting, okay, it's well. It's hard to, but you know, I mean, it's possible. It's not, I mean, there, there, there are many recognized and, and accepted genera that you can hybridize and, you know, and so it doesn't necessarily, that, that'd be a, you know, a point of in favor of combining them, I suppose, but it, it's not anything definitive by any means, you know, it just means that it would be, it would, I guess, avoid ruling it out entirely. So. Well, Chad, the Sansevieria yeah. stalwart who has come over to the world of Sansevieria, why don't you show us uh, some of the ones right. that you have here? Absolutely, yeah, we've um, been focusing a lot on, as I mentioned, these, the ones that are less commonly grown and the ones we can really do justice to. These were only fairly recently planted, but especially the ones that are, that are arborescent or coalescent, they mean, where they have a major central stem. This is Sansevieria poelii, but which is a name that's applied to a great diversity of different looking things. And these can get over six feet tall. Wow. And uh, they're very spiky. Each of these is <laughs> quite dagger-like. So, um, Where so do there's- Where the flowers come out of? Like the leaf axles or at the top or? At the top, yeah. This one has been chopped. So it now, was a yeah. propagule that came to us that way. And, uh, but these will grow quite tall and then they flower quite rarely in cultivation and they're hard to get to flower indoors. They're hard to 
find a place indoors that's safe, <laughs> you know. And, you know, the, the amount of time, too, in a darker space to get these large it would be very great. So, and they also, they, they produce stolons underground or sometimes at the surface and will create a whole colony and they can be quite architectural. We have some, and then, yeah, this is a good example of that here. This is Sansevieria bagamoyensis, which is from Kenya. It's one of the arborescent types. Yeah, that, this reminds me of some of the arborescent aloes as well that kind of get that kind of uh, statuesque look. Absolutely. And it looks and it looks a lot like a dracaena. So it so this is these are some of the plants that kind of show the close relationship that people long known because they're in, the flowers are very similar to dracaena flowers, but still the leaves are very thick and extremely sharp. Uh, yeah, they are. This is not something you'd want to put where children are playing. I mean, this looks deceivingly <laughs> thin, and when you touch it, it's very sturdy. It's very, yeah, it's remarkably sturdy, even though these leaves are relatively thin for these arborescent types. And then this is one that actually has stolons that go across the oh, surface yeah, of the soil cool and then root looking. in. And so this was originally planted uh, just a one stem in the center, and it's formed this uh, remarkable little colony. This almost looks like a little kirky eye style ones over here. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's one that they call, I think it's that's... Cleopatra. That... You also have some of the cultivar types then as well. Yeah, we have a few of those and a few of the hybrids as well, but we're mainly focused on species. And the thing is that a lot of these that, are, that, that have trade names, they, a lot of them actually are species. They are actually plants that were field collected, but because there's so much diversity to be sorted out in this genus that a lot of them are, they end up with a name in cultivation before, you know, people figure out what species they belong to or if the spe they've even been described. Hmm. In fact, there's one um, great uh, Sansevieria person, Barry Yinger, who's uh, a friend, he used to have a nursery in the U.S. and he moved to Thailand and then during the pandemic he ended up in Tanzania on an extended expedition to collect Sansevieria's and document them and he's finding all sorts of new species and sorting out all sorts of uh, mysteries and, you know, within them. So there's, it's a, even though there's you know, in the range of 90 species described now, I mean, could easily probably double you know, in the next decade or so. Right, when you spend your time on it, then you start finding things. Absolutely. All and, and one thing that growing a lot of these in the garden can do is allow us to sort some of these things out because we can grow them until they flower and, and then determine which differences are due to, you know, when you're growing them in different conditions versus uh, actual differences in, in their DNA. So I also like that one in the back too, that thick Oh, this very thick one, yeah, one. that's a very special one. That's one from Angola. It's Sansevieria fisteri with, uh, with a P, P-F-I-S-T-E-R-I. And uh, there's, only a, about, there's only about three species, I think, in Angola, and this is the rarest of them. And you can see it already has a new, new shoot coming up yep. next to it here so that's and is this like the final shape that it gets like this fan shape yeah yeah there's a whole group of sansevierias that that are characterized by having this fan shape with the leaves in one plane more or less and a fairly short stem so there is a stem that that these are attached to but in these ones that really get fan shaped the stem is short and then if you extend the stem you get those arborescent types, the right. types that... So Sansevierias are a wonderful um, example of variations on a theme, because like all plants, you have only leaves, stems, and roots, but then you kind of tweak each of those parameters a little bit, and you can get all these amazing shapes and forms. Has there been any study on whether these fan shapes grow from like east to west or north to south, you know, in or with the prevailing winds or not within the prevailing winds? I'm making that stuff up right now, but I'm just curious. <laughs> You know, not that I'm aware, but there are phenomena like that that occur in a lot of other plants, like that, you know, coconut palms tend to lean in a, the same direction, and, and actually some of the cook pines, the aracarias, actually, aracaria columnaris from uh, New Caledonia always tends to lean south or so. You know, so it's... I do wonder, because a lot of the ones that come from windy territories are often very circular, so that the wind will shear off of them. So the fact that it's a fan shape in one plane 
and it's kind of like circular, makes me wonder if there's something with the evolutionary d dynamics of the wind there. It could be, and that's when one of the things we can start to study when we grow these, you know, grow a lot of these different taxa in the same place and, yeah. and see like, what the or if there's an orientation that de develops on the new growth. Endless amount of like grad <laughs> studies. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's a, there's so much to be learned and so many fundamental questions to, to study in plants that, you know, we may think that all these questions must have been asked and answered, but we're only yeah. really beginning on many of them. Some of these arborescent types, you know, that we pointed out kind of remind me, I can't remember now that I, it's, I, I love the gasteria and I'm blanking on the, the species name, but it's a gasteria that grows off a cliff and it has uh, the not characteristic gasteria shape where it's like squat but it actually grows more like this and it kind of hangs off the cliff. Are all these like more desert ones or are they kind of growing off uh, rocks or cliff faces? And I just, because I'm looking at the morphology of this one, for example. Yeah, no, there's, it's true. There are a lot of plants with this kind of architecture, even orchids, you know, there are some that have similar configuration that are growing on other things, but these, no, I, these are all growing in the ground and growing mm. upright. Um, as far as I know, yeah. I mean, there are some there are some Sansevierias that grow in rock crevices for sure, and you know. But I think they they tend to be the more fan shaped ones. And and there's one there's one we don't have planted here yet, but it's called serpentine. That's a that's a wild you know type that was collected by Juan Chahini in many years. I think in Kenya, it has leaves that are very long, and, I, and it was growing in, in rock gaps. As far as I. Yeah. I know. So yeah, they've they've got an incredible range of habitats they've adapted to, but not too many growing, it kind of hanging off cliffs. But they certainly could. If we just pan over here, Doc Block is uh, actually holding a, a snake plant. He looks like Vanna White. <laughs> Do you know <laughs> much about this one, Chad? Yeah, this is a uh, this is one that's actually now has a species name, but it for a long time it circulated under the number of the original collector who's very famous in the succulent world, John Lavranos, who was a remarkable man who went uh, to all sorts of uh, parts of Africa and, and that are very difficult to access today and collected plants in the 60s, 70s, through the 80s and 90s. And in the Sansevieri world, there's lots of uh, plants that still circulate with his number. This one was called Lavranos uh, Collection Number 23295, which is now part of the species that was named in his honor, Sansevieria lavranii. And um, it's from Somalia. And pretty much all we know about Somalian uh, Sansevierias and a lot of other Somalian plants and cultivation are due to him. So, And uh, these are some of the plants that are a little bit cold sensitive sometimes, like some of the scarring on the older leaves was from when we dipped into the lower 40s last year and the year before. And uh, like here, they sometimes get some damage and then but uh, this year we got into the upper 40s for several days and it doesn't seem to be showing any damage yet. So we're Well, that's a really good test though too to see because a lot of times people will express like what's the lower limit? What's the lower temperature li limit of these plants? And oftentimes people don't know until you actually put them to the lower limit. It's very true. And, uh, and it's the, um, and where they've been really testing the limits on these like in Arizona and Southern California, they found that as one might expect, it's often the plants from farther south in Africa, the cooler climates like South Africa and Angola and, and Zimbabwe and whatnot that are actually more cold hardy. But these plants from Somalia and Kenya and stuff tend to be more sensitive and they're the ones that they have to protect. I actually have found that myself because I had one against my southern window that often gets pretty cold and it gets that, uh, it got some pretty severe cold damage, similar where it just gets those necrotic spots. Yeah. So it goes, just goes to show you knowing a little bit of natural history and geography of where it's from and elevation and patterns would maybe help somebody growing it indoors a little better knowing what position to put it in. Absolutely. And then yeah. also and paying close attention to how, the, how this kind of damage relates to the climatic conditions is important because a lot of people just immediately think I must have some fungus going through my collection when they see these discolorations. And, and often fungi do colonize the damage and so you get... Uh, but then the actual source is the cold damage, so it's very, very good to be keeping an eye on, on our plants and understanding that there are so many different things that threaten them. So. 
There's one with flatter leaves. Do you mind if we actually show that off? Because it's just, means, a different, yep, and we have... it's just a different type of morphological type here. This was named after uh, one of the famous Sansevieria collectors, uh, Dr. Spex, and um, it's, uh, it was a German collector, I believe. And uh, yeah, this was fairly recently described. And um, yeah, and it does look, it, it is sort of like somewhere in between what, you know, the regular Sansevieria trifasciata and the whale fin yeah. kind of wider and, and the, uh, these the, wide leaf types are very, there's so many amazing variations and you can feel how it's rough on the undersides mm. and smooth on the top and yeah. sometimes that's used to distinguish some of these, these taxa, like some of them are rough on both sides. and. Interesting, so that's how so some of them will be classified then. That's part of the description for some of these fairly good, because otherwise we usually tend to be limited to, to the flowers to really to get really definitive ID, and some Sansevierias very rarely flower, some very regularly flower, like Sansevieria cylindrica seems to flower pretty much every year for us, but others are, are fairly shy to flower. Is there a good field guide or book that key for snake plants now or not so much? Yeah, there actually is one, a nice up-to-date one by Dr. Bob Webb uh, that just was published uh, last year. And, and he's uh, out in Arizona, right? He's out in Arizona, yep, yep he is. I got a lot of snake plants from him. In charge of, yeah, arid yeah. lands greenhouses out there. And yep. he's, uh, he's described a lot of the new species of Sansevieria. So. And in fact, like this was also another Lavranos um, collection from Somalia but now is uh, Sansevieria distica. Hmm. He just described. So that one is, or it, it also went as dwarf samurai is probably the most yes. common. Yeah. Which got into tissue culture somehow. And, uh, you know, despite being a fairly slow growing and, you know, probably very, very rare in the wild, only found around one locality in Somalia. But, you know, it's one of the wonderful things about horticulture. Now anybody who wants to grow this plant that was very difficult to collect and, you know, difficult to propagate, now has a chance to do so, so. So interesting that something that thick, like, I don't know, that fleshy actually translates okay to, in tissue culture, because not all plants go to tissue culture well. It just is kind of interesting Absolutely, to think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'd be very curious how they <laughs> do Sansevieria tissue culture, but yeah. we'll have to explore that at some point. I mean, and you could also tell that a lot of these snake plants are getting plenty of sun because they are lighter in shade, I feel. <laughs> Absolutely, and that's one thing that we've learned is that some of them, you know, especially if they've been growing, you know, in some shade to put them out in full sun, they tend to suffer before they right. adapt to the new leaves. And, um, and some of them just look better and do better in shade, uh, even though in the wild they seem, to, <laughs> they seem to be growing right out in very harsh conditions. But this is Sansevieria cylindrica. And this is one that is actually flowering right now. That tends to, and the interesting thing is that many of them do tend to flower in the winter. Hmm. Which is interesting. Apparently this is common to uh, people who grow them in Arizona and other places too. Is that, you know, December, January is a time when many of them are flowering. Well, is, it makes me think of a lot of the caudiciforms because they have a tendency to leaf out and flower in the winter months, which would be the cooler months, I guess technically. Yeah. So I wonder, I mean, I'm not saying that these are from Cape Town, but some of them are from. Well, this is yeah. actually from Southern Africa. Yeah. yeah. The cylindrica is a South African one. So yeah, it would make, that, would, that would fit. Interesting. And this is like where some of the debate has always come from because before genetic analysis, some botanists would have said, hey, this flower looks a lot like the structure of a Dracaena. So I think even in the past, there was uh, controversy as to whether snake plants should be subsumed into Dracaena. For sure, for sure. I mean, they're clear. I mean, they're very close. They're very, you know, they're all part of the same larger group, and their flowers are extremely similar. But, um, but nevertheless, you know, they do hold together as a big group. Mm -hmm. So even with the DNA, so uh, you know, once it's one of those issues that's, you know, part science, part data, and part philosophy. You know, so. It's whatever you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's very common in botany, you know, for, for there to be differences of opinion on, on these sorts of things. Or, and, you're, and people are allowed to use, you know, older naming systems if they disagree with, the, say, the current 
you know, consensus, and, and sometimes they're proved right and sometimes not, you know, so. Well, I would argue that it's actually healthy to have some healthy debate about, in the, in the science world, about whether, you know, something is one thing or the other. Oh, yes, yeah. That's what that's, keeps everybody on their toes. <laughs> for sure, and that's, yeah, we need to always be questioning and challenging, and that's how science progresses, you know, so that's absolutely, and how a lot of things in life progress, and, um, this one's interesting, almost looks mangrovey, right? Oh yes, yes, this is one of the v many, many variations of Sansevieria sofruticosa, some of which have been uh, sorted out and given different names. And, uh, and they do tend to have these long, kind of horizontal, stolen-like stems. And then, yeah, they have these aerial roots that go down, much like a mangrove. And, mm -hmm. and they form these remarkable spreading colonies. And you can actually grow them pretty well in hanging baskets. You need to watch out for the eyes, because <laughs> yeah. they have very uh, <laughs> spiky leaves. But they make fantastic basket plants. And they, or they will fill in to areas quite effectively. You can see how the, the architecture of these, that they tend to just make a few a few uh, leaves on each side, and then they don't tend to, they tend to expand more horizontally rather than the central stem creating a large structure, whereas the more Sansevieria poelii types like this, they, you basically, you, you keep growing in height more on each stem, and then they have, many of them have underground stolons, and you get these colonies of uh, very spiky, very tall stems. So you have all those variations within the world of Sansevieria. From, Here's another leaf type, which is a bit more like, I don't know if they call them bat-shaped or what these are considered. Yeah, this is Sansevieria hollii, one that, which also comes in a great many variations. And, um, but they do call them bats or baseball bats. And, they're, and they're, that also goes along for a few other species like Sansevieria scimitariformis and, and what not, and, uh, but there's also a lot of diversity in this group. This is one that's called a uh, super pink bat because uh, it's very dark and, uh, and so they've got names. So once, you know, there's, there's more, much as in many plant groups, there's much more diversity in cultivation than we have official names for in science, you know. So often characteristics that might be of interest to us as horticulturists, like a darker leaf or something might not be considered, you know, something worthy of, of naming separately, so we, we have to improvise and we use these cultivar names, you know. The one behind you, is this some of the cold damage example? Yeah, this one is pretty sensitive, so it gets cold damage that then kind of lets some fungal problems fungal, yeah. enter, and so after each winter or during winter, we end up with uh, some dieback like this. I just want to show folks this in case they recognize anything like this in their plant, because oftentimes when something, um, bad happens or you start to see necrotic spots or anything, you have to say, well, wh what happened, you know? What did I do wrong? But sometimes it's a cultural thing or a weather thing or anything along those lines. So, but the rest Absolutely. of it's healthy and the and fact often, that- And often the, the, the older growth was also less adapted to being in full sun so that when, you know, that's the thing with, with plants is they can't like, you know, when we get wounded, we have ways to heal. Or the original structure plants, don't usually, you know, so they, they just, they adapt by growing new structures. So exactly. in this case, the new growths around it, but the older parts in the middle either got damaged by some cold or by too much sun. And we can see some examples of much more recent uh, plantings on the other side that have sun damage that is definitely sun damage. But this is one of the arborescent types, and this is what pro now goes under the name Sansevieri arborescens which used to encompass a whole bunch of different plants, and now they've been separating out other species like the Sansevieria bagamoyensis we just looked at. But, but this one has underground stolons. Hmm. So the new, this one hasn't been planted so long, but it is putting up the new, new shoots, and it makes this nice colony of very symmetrical uh, vertical growth. It's not, it looks more like what people would associate with Dracaena-type yeah. growth than with Sansevieria, but once again, has these super spiky leaves and has this, you know, the underground rhizomes that tend to go some distance, which sense, which dracaenas don't tend to do. And also, you can you can cut the piece of the leaf and it will root and form a new plant, which also dracaenas don't do. And this is one that, uh, that goes under the name banana, 
Banana? Yeah, which uh, may be something like Sansevieri Ehrenbergii or, or another, uh, but this is probably something from Somalia that hasn't really been sorted out, but it's widespread in horticulture as, as banana, or there may be more than one different uh, plant called banana, but yeah, this is the long what stolen. Is, what produced. is under this uh, stone? Like what kind of substrate are you growing these in? It's uh, just sand, actually. This oh, is wow. a kind of a raised bed of sand, and then the stone is just to uh, keep the weeds down. And, uh, but yeah, we're, I mean, Sansevierias do like good drainage and other succulents do, and that's what we tried to do here. And, Amazing. And also, South Florida doesn't have much depth of soil naturally. We've got, at least in this part of Miami, we're on a rock ridge on limestone, so the, the natural depth of, of soil is sometimes only six inches, and so it helps to have a raised bed for many of these plants. And then this is a Sansevieria from, from South Africa, Sansevieria Pearsonii, which is a, probably a good, will be a good test of whether the fans are in a certain orientation. This was recently transplanted from a pot, so it's not yet indicative of what orientation these might prefer. Although this, you know, I think these are new growth and you can see they're, they're aligning yeah. sort of east-west here. So we'll see if that's turns out to be consistent. Yeah, keep me updated on that. I'm so curious. <laughs> could, be, could be quite interesting. And then we're interspersed more Sansevierias among the other succulents here. This is another version of Sansevieria polelii. And um, we're this, this growing in full sun, it's interesting, it, it's, it looks quite different. I've got some of this at home that I grew in very deep shade and it gets much larger, more luxuriant in shade. And that's, so some of these plants, even though they'll do well in full sun and might even be in full sun in nature, some of them seem to uh, prefer to be shady. So, so that, that's something we're, we're learning here. That this, some, this one I know is breaking from the, the mold of Sansevieria, but I just want to point this out because this is such an interesting orchid. Oh yeah, that's one of my very favorite orchids. And it's from the same areas that Sansevierias grow in East Africa, and Eulophia petersii. And, um, and it comes in a whole bunch of different variations too, even though it's one species. This is a, a, a kind of a medium sized one. And this is a smaller, smaller version from another part of, of East Africa. Interesting, this one looks- Same species. Yeah, this one grows more like some of the Isoclades. Yeah. That thinness of leaf. They're 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 in a similar uh, similar habitats, in yeah. fact. So they're but yeah, that's a and that's an orchid that is more often grown by succulent collectors than by orchid collectors, which is interesting. And I think when you say they grow in like similar habitats, you begin to see the similarity in the morphology types as well. Oh yes, very yeah. very thick leaves and very sharp <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> to protect from grazer grazing animals and. Uh, and botanists sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the prying hands of botanists. Because <laughs> John Lavranos, at least it's a rumor, I don't know if it's actually true, but he was said, even though he collected all these Sansevierias, to have not liked them because they were so spiky, so painful. But, you know, the thing is, you'd have to ask him to take his shirt off and show the scars, you <laughs> that's know? Right, that's how many, right. How many did he really collect? <laughs> that's right, they do. Uh, I'm, I'm getting some of those now. So. <laughs> Here's some more in flower. Is this still a this cylindrica? Is, this is another version of cylindrica, which comes in a whole bunch. There's a, in fact, there's one uh, version of it that, that they call, um, I think it's, yeah, there's like a giant version of it that, oh yeah, they call it mohawk, I guess. That, huh. that was the, which is, it's a large cylindrica that if it's grown well, you know, it kind of gets a very distinct fan shape, but it's, but it's Sansevieria, but it's another, form of Sansevieria. I think I've seen them. They look almost like a, I might have even seen it called fish tail or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. There are various names they give it, but, um, but it's an, and the, this is a very hardy species too. It's very cold tolerant. And here are some others and right this, here. Uh, these are this some looks, new plantings. That's, this looks familiar. This is you know, Sansevieria pinguicula. Yes, pinguicula. A, a fantastic uh, plant, and this when this gets growing, it will also often form the aerial stolons and the aerial roots, and mm. 
Do they stay yeah. kind of small? Pinguicula sounds small. There are different versions of pinguicula. Some that get quite large. We have a larger one over here. They can get, you know, pretty big. Mm. And there are other, there's a pinguicula officially described as variety nana that tends to be smaller. Yes, that's right. And uh, so, yeah, there's a, you know, once again, there's so much diversity within, within what are the described species of Sansevieria. And, you know, it seems like every, every town in, in these parts of Africa has a different, a different version of a lot of these. So it's, uh, the amount of genetic diversity is absolutely tremendous. Well, you know, it's one of those things that when I was talking to a scientist who studied snake plants in Sansevieria, and she said, you know, they have a tendency to sh sh send off a lot of variations because when they did the genetic study, a lot of the things that were, they thought were like something different than Trifasciata, for example, were just a color variation. So it yeah. seems to be like one of those types of plants that will throw off a sport that is really different, you know? Absolutely, yeah, they seem to be, yeah, they s somehow, yeah, they, they just are able to develop this tremendous diversity in very small areas sometimes, you know, and they, and, uh, you know, and, that, and that's diversity we can see in many plants, you know, there are, you have diverse, like, like I, I'm actually, you know, during like our recent cold events here, I've actually been able to see in some euphorbias and whatnot that how like two plants that looked, looked identical, yet one of them got, gets damaged and one doesn't. And it turns out they're probably different clones, but at different you know, but they had some, they, they act, there's, there are clearly differences in them, but we, you can't see them visibly. And fortunately, Sansevieria is, they tend to advertise they're different, which is. Well, you know, what's, this just goes to show you why it's important to have many different genetics. Because if the world got a little colder or got a little warmer, you just found, you know, that one plant in there that had the, the slightly different genetics that could make it go through a cold spell better than the other one. Absolutely. And the same goes for disease tolerance. You know, a lot of our crops, they were, it's been so critical to find relatives of them that, you know, we're able to tolerate a pest better or a disease. And it may not even be something that you could see visibly that they were different. And, but the chemicals, you know, their chemical makeup or their ability to defend themselves was different. And the, the pests certainly see that, you know. Yeah, so absolutely. That's, how about this one over here? This one's like a fat, a fat one. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one that was uh, that was actually described fairly recently at Sansevieria poesiae, which is named for a Guilford Poise, who was a a great uh, contributor to our knowledge of Sansevieria, who actually lived in Africa, and um, and this one it grow, was described from from Kismayo Island off of Kenya, very near the very near to the border with Somalia. And uh, there are several versions of it around, and they're still uh, kind of sorting out whether there are mainland populations and whatnot. But it's got these very heavy glaucous leaves, kind of with some bluish tint. And uh, and this is one that I think does sometimes like grow off little cliffs. And it kind of has that habit, and I've seen some pictures of, of that. So it's going to be fun to see this kind of crawl through this area. And um, they look like beached sea creatures, to me. <laughs> they, you know, they, like kind of like the Wallwitchia, where you're like, what did, where did that come up on shore? You know, they certainly do. Yeah, it was, and it, and was really when I discovered you know, for myself that there was all this diverse and all these these ones that looked very different than the, than the standard Trifasciata that I realized, you know, I'd been guilty of judging the genus by one of its <laughs> thinking, well, I've seen one sense of area, I've seen them all, but you know, in, in plants and just like in other areas of life, that's almost never the case. You know? That's true. And the subtleties actually make all the difference at the end of the day. They sure do. Yep, they're, uh, yeah, when you kind of deep down, you realize that they're all tied together, but they're actually slight, slight changes in how thick the leaves are or where, how tall the stems are can give you a whole different look architecturally, which is pretty remarkable. See, this is another plant that might be considered Poesiae, but it doesn't really have the fan shape as much. The leaves are more in a spiral. And so are these more like, you know, AFFs or they have an affinity if like they're not classified as a species yet they're going to be like oh that is similar to Poesiae or this one tends to circulate as blue Q they call it which uh, I guess is related to this Kiwayu 
island, another island there. And um, that may be from the mainland near where, where Poesia is from. So people tend to either give it a cultivar name or a collection number. And, uh, and then eventually, if something new is described that includes it, they'll say, well, it includes this, this collection. And, you know, so. Well, I didn't know that about the cultivar name, that it could actually potentially be a species and people just easily give it a cultivar name. You know, like in the world of begonias, you know, they, they're often given a, a number or whatnot. So that's very interesting because a lot of those cultivars may actually be a species, is what you're saying. Yeah, yes, but if, they, if they've come from the wild, you know, and, and people just gave them kind of an informal cultivar name, they could easily be recognized as a different species. And, and the thing is that, you, and, it, and it shows there's a lot of virtue in the, in the begonia system where they get, have a universal Number. set of, of numbers for undescribed things because you end up in, in most plant groups like Sansevieria, you know, if you have these undescribed entities, you know, like you don't, and you don't have a universal numbering system, they have probably at least, you know, there might be a 10 different collectors who, and, and their collection numbers associated with different sense of areas. And that can get fairly confusing for people to remember all the, you know, is this a Lovranos number or a Chahinian number or a, you know, Powie's number, or David Richards collected a lot, you know, they have all the, they each have a little initial for the collector and then their number. And, uh, and it's, it's really to the credit of the Sansevieria community that they preserved much of this and kept the number associated with the plants, but it, they may need to have a system for, now that there are all sorts of new collections coming into cultivation. You know, have, to have to agree to, agree to, to what that <laughs> system is going to be. That's a no, whole other thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. So far, no progress on that. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is a, kind of an interesting one. This is Sansevieria bella, which has these long leaves that kind of snake along the ground as it develops. It's, it's in that group like Sansevieria sofruticosa, and you can see the aerial roots forming. So eventually this is gonna form quite a colony here with this kind of sinuous, kind of snake-like leaves. What is your um, most favorite growth structure since now that you've been turned on to snake plants? Which ones do you gravitate towards? I like the arborescent types, the types that grow above the ground. Cause I, I'm, re I'm really interested in symmetry. I like, I, I got, I, my first, or not my first, but one of my major plant loves is horsetails, Equisetum, and they have that kind of primeval radial symmetry and, and some of these arborescent sense of areas, either with their leaves going around in a spiral or in a perfect fan vertically. You know, I just, all that geometry and architecture I really like, even though they're kind of dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd imagine even with the Equisetums, there's a lot of silica to strengthen the Equisetum. Do you, I think there's a lot of silica in these because they, they, they're quite ar architectural in the same way. You know, they are quite rough on the outside. I haven't run across any mention of silica, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, a lot of monocots, and these are Sansevierias or are, are monocots, uh, they do, do tend to like silica or accumulate some silica like grasses do and whatnot. So yeah, I should see if I can find any information on that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, and that's, and, and the roughness of the leaves, you know, is sometimes used to help distinguish among, in some sense of areas are very, very smooth leaves. Some have, you know, very abrasive leaves. So it's, a, it's a amazingly diverse in that way. And it's kind of a remarkable how, when, you know, you get a whole, you get some very different data when you grow plants in the ground than in pots sometimes. This is sense of area, Arenbergii, which, um, that's a quite common one I've seen in the market. Yeah, this is a, a Aaron Burgia is kind of a, a name that's been a problem for a long time just because it was applied to plants from a huge region, you know, from Yemen and Somalia all the way into Kenya. And now they've been sorting it out into different species so that to say which is, you know, this is one that's that still remains as Aaron Burgia, even with all the new species described, but it's kind of remarkable. So we planted this here and then it's put up a new shoot, you wow. know, at least you know, two and a half feet away. Yeah. Whereas in pots, you know, you get the, those rhizomes, those underground stems that produce the new shoots, you know, we'll just circle around and they'll come up in the same pot. But yeah. some of them, you know, have, and then like this one is producing yeah. a new, with a, a superficial 
rhizome are stolen. Yeah. And, uh, and so it'll be very interesting to watch how the, the architecture of these different colonies form because these well, that one, the Aaron Burgii that you had mentioned, he might just not be happy right there. He might have know something underground that he wants to be closer to, to this guy, you know, at the end of the day. This is true, yeah. It could, what makes plants, because some plants are very hardwired into how far apart their, their rhizomes will grow. And oh, sometimes, other times they'll just grow further if they find the resources that hmm. they want. So, so it could also be like your hair is what you're saying. At some point it just kind of like says that's as the length I'm growing and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These the plants are kind of an interesting, you know, combination of what's, you know, things that are kind of pre-programmed and, and adaptation and how they how they can um, and do that. And like and like this one, this is Sansevieria Pearsonii, another uh, one from southern Africa, but you can see it's one that does tend to fa form fairly tight colonies. And once again, some of these, it's interesting, these new new growths, this one came up in this orientation kind of, and that one is a different orientation. So they would be interesting to see how they... My theory might be debunked already based on that <laughs> one. <laughs> might be, but we'll see. But it's often a matter of tendencies. Yeah. You know, so we'll have to see how it... And the other thing is that we have other confounding factors, like this gets shade from this big Dracaena here. So. Right. So, yeah, I guess it is a... These are Dracaenas that they're growing under, and you can see that they do make their aerial roots because they're kind of similar to... Oh, yeah. Some fancy did, berries. Th th did those get cut off, or did they just dry out? No, they just they just stopped developing because of drying out. And huh. So this is kind of a, a family plot here. The, a family plot. The Dracaena thickens. family plot. Yeah. Or it could just be a, a big reunion. That's They're right. Reunited yeah. after all these years. That's <laughs> Across right, different yeah. continents and all. <laughs> They're just having a no, yeah, they, they know they're related. It's just whether they've got the same family name or not. Yeah, so we'll have the exactly. Same, same genus name and they'll, which is uh, something the plants don't worry about nope. too much. Nope, it's only us that get Something our panties that, in a bundle about it. That's right, that's right. <laughs> names are a big deal for us. And, um, yeah, and this is another, another one of the bats. This is the one they call super pink, which might be a sense of area holly eye, but nobody's really officially decided what species it is, but it's clearly something from the wild and it has a David Richards collection number, which I'm uh, not recalling at the moment, but it's, uh, but yeah, this one, and this one, when it's grown a little more shade, gets much larger, but it's... Uh... I love the coloration on these. It kind of reminds me of the um, aloes that get like that kind of um, mosaic aloes, I think they're called, but... Oh yeah, yeah. And then the, the I think these were the kirky eyes, you know, the Sansevieri kirky eyes, which I think are now Dracaena petheras. They have this kind of like mottled appearance. I think that looks really attractive. Absolutely. Yeah, the patterns can be really striking and they, and they vary tremendously even within within the species and within, you know, and among and among them. And then they're also, you know, the new growth tends to be especially especially intense whatever pattern there is and yeah. then it tends to fade a little on the older leaves as they have been in the sun longer yeah. and the extent to which, you know, different different entities with these different sense of areas will hold their color patterns is also also varies quite a bit so is this one growing in a line that one yeah right yeah this is a an interesting one it was another one that circulated as a collection number i think another david richards collection number for a long time from somalia and then it was named in honor of juan chahinian who was uh, who uh, founded the international sense of area society or, or at least he uh, got the journal restarted and so now it's Sansevieria chahiniani. Yeah, and we planted the original one about here, and it's sort of grew in a line, and then there's one further along there. Oh, but, yeah, look at him. He's growing right in the And a couple more here. Interesting. And so it's been kind of surprising. When it's grown in shade, the, the leaves tend to get taller, and they, when they're more exposed, they tend to hug the ground more like this, but it's... Uh, Fascinating. You see, he says the only place we can grow them outdoors, you know, in the continental U.S. So we, you know, in a pot, you'd have no idea what this was going to do. So it's a, yeah, take uh, advantage of it for sure. I'm glad mm -hmm. you're experimenting with that here. So it's a fun natural experiment, or at least garden experiment here. And then, 
And as I mentioned, the, some of these uh, sensitive areas are very, you know, they don't like to move from a shady area into a sunny area. Yep. And so these we planted just, you know, back in November when, you know, the sun is lower in the sky and less intense. But they've been growing in shade, you know, in part shade, 50% shade. And uh, they got really burned from the sun. I see that. You can say this face is south, and so the, the directly f facing leaves have gotten burned, and those behind are fine. Yeah, let me take a look at the ones behind. Oh, yeah. So Look at the difference. Oop, I just walked through a spider. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Spider. Yeah, totally different. And then the new growth should be adapted to the higher intensity light. Because the, the, there was a, a big euphorbia, a big fire sticks euphorbia here that we removed and put some Sansevierias in. But it was shading the lower part of the stem. This is one that had been growing in the full sun for a long time, yeah. the Sansevieria labranii. But when the shade was taken away, it also got a lot of sun damage here. You said Sansevieria labranii. Is that like after LeBron James? But no, sorry, Lavrania. Yeah, oh. lo, lo, after John Lavranos. But yeah, there there could be one after LeBron James. It's very see. tall. It's a very <laughs> tall arborescent one. That's right. That's right. Yeah, they. You could name there. There are so many new species to describe. I'm sure that people will get more and more creative with choosing names to honor. And this one, whereas this one, we also planted out. And it got some sun damage, but less, you know? Yeah. And it's also of another version of Sansevieria lavranii and, and got uh, more yellowing. So we're waiting for the new growth to adapt to that. And this is a larger pinguicula here. Oh yeah, that is a little bit meatier. And you can see the original planting is a little bit, a little bit burned here and a little bit, and then it formed a new pup here yeah. with uh, aerial roots coming down. And the That's their flower stem. And stalks, it did flower, huh? yeah. yeah. Do they get primarily um, orange berries, do you know? Yeah, it tends to be, most of them I've seen have been orange or a little reddish, reddish orange. And don't know if that's universal, but it does seem, and Sansevierias are very, and this is a smaller pinguicula here. It's, uh... And then here's another kind of type. Is this like a fisher eye, or which one is this? Nope, this is Francisii. Francisii, yeah. that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah, which is a very odd, uh, you know, it's a very odd configuration for it. It's kind of, it's kind of arborescent, but then it, it doesn't stay up. It just kind of snakes along the ground. Yeah, so this has been used in a lot of hybrids because it, it gives a really neat architecture with those stacked leaves and. And that was one that was uh, in circulation and cultivation for a long time before it was named also. So it's, and then this is Sansevieria parodii, which has the interesting, very curved leaves, but it's sort of a fan shaped with the addition of the neat curvature. I have to show a little aloe in bloom right here. Oh yes. Aloes and Sansevierias make a great combination. They really do. I got really into aloes actually, you know, and I mean, there's, talk about cultivars. There's endless cultivars of aloes. Oh, here's, here's oh, yeah. one we should feature, like the dark green one, stocky ones in the back that look like asparagus. Oh, yes, yes. This is uh, one of my favorite. This is one that I, I actually, one of the first Sansevierias I like. This is Sansevieria erythraeae. Yep. That's from Ethiopia. Yep. And apparently there's only one clone in cultivation that came from Coco Crater Botanic Garden in Hawaii from years and years, because the U.S. Department of Agriculture got interested in Sansevierias back in the 50s or so, maybe the 40s, and as a source of fiber. Fiber, yeah. And, and we're hybridizing and breeding them and sent people to collect. And uh, this one's got really smooth, cylindrical, clustered stems. And uh, it's a very, yeah, it's a beautiful species, but apparently no one, I think it was described, you know, long ago and there's no, this is the only living specimen is this one clone and I haven't heard of anyone getting any others. Well, I definitely have a clone and I have this actually growing in a northern window in my house and it is such a wonderful grower and it has these darker leaves. So I thought like, uh, I, I'm gonna put it in a little bit more shady conditions. I don't know that to be true, but comparatively to some of the other ones, I don't know, it seems absolutely fine in that window. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think it would it actually prefers a little bit of shade. It yeah. seems to be a little little bit stressed in full sun, but it certainly 
healthy enough. Hmm. And this, this is Sansevierius stuckii, the elephant tusk Sansevierius wow. that we got I mean, from... That is just so cool, right? The, it's a fantastic plant and it can get uh, wow. much larger than this. So we'll see it. this was a pot specimen from the president of the... Oh, you almost could see that it was a pot specimen. Look at the little section of it from the pot. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This spread is, out, young man, spread this out. This was growing in Arizona for many years in Alan Michael Bus of the Sansevieria Society's collection. And last, uh, well, now it's two years ago. In uh, October 2021, we um, actually went on a big succulent road trip and had a large U-Haul and, and actually picked up a bunch of these Sansevierias from wonderful collectors in Arizona. And... Uh, and they're happy to be in Florida now. They're ones that they couldn't grow in the ground there, but we can grow in the ground here. So. Well, I'm just gonna make a slight observation here. I know we're in the shade right now, um, but these seem a lot less sun stressed over here. Is yeah. it shady here almost all the time? Or this kind of like little dappled light in this section? This time of year, it's shady. In the, when the sun is low in the sky, the rainforest in the distance and actually tends to keep the direct sun off most of the day and the other cycads growing there. And so, yeah, once I started realizing that some of these new plantings were getting sunburned, even this time of year, I focused more on planting in this area. So, yeah. so they'd have more of a time to gradually adjust. During full summer, when the sun's higher, this will get more, more direct sun, though, though we get some, some shelter from the Dracaenas around us here. What's that one behind you? It looks like two cobra heads coming out of the... Earth. Oh yeah, this is a this is a very interesting one. This is Sansevieria sinus simiorum, which uh, means monkey bay. Hmm. Uh, so sinus, and then yeah, the simian, and then the monkey, and then the sinus, like a big gap. And uh, this was described by by Juan Chihinian, and it's uh, and this and this comes in several versions. And this one they call giant green bat. So we've got a bigger version of it. I can show you, but it's known to have for having these kind of spoon like expansion of the tip. And this can get quite tall and quite fat and um, quite dark colored. And they've got some version, they've got another version on the other side of the plot that's got a lot more patterning on the, on the stem. So they, um, oh, sorry, on the leaf, these are leaves, not stems. The stem is actually completely hidden under underground. And that is the kind of interesting thing is that this is the, in that group of Sansevierias that the stem is completely underground, like the Sansevieria trifasciata that we're so used to. Um, and, and then only the leaves protrude above, but sometimes the leaves look very stem-like and very cylindrical, mm -hmm. like both Stuckii and the Sinus simiorum. Mm -hmm. And Fisher eye here, this is the- With This little anole. But uh, it's another, once again, it's a species that comes in a lot of variation. This yeah. is the one they call Arusha. Just Arusha kind of, blue, actually, which is the name of a look. It's like two fingers wide. <laughs> That's an especially thick form. It's yeah. not the typical. And that one's, a, it's named after Arusha Tanzania, which uh, has some, some special populations of fisher eye around it. Hmm. And, um, but they're all considered that species. We just give them different cultivar names. Look at the arborescence one that has the three bamboo posts around it. It's yeah, curving, that's it's a like recent. A, recent planting that needs some extra support until it roots in. You can see it's actually making some nice aerial roots. Oh yeah. This is one of the versions of what tentatively calling Sansevieria arborescence. Um, probably will need to sort out its name. And we've got some of this as another arborescence version with kind of longer, more glaucous leaves. So there's, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how these grow out. This is a, another uh, Sansevieria poelii that you can see that where its main height isn't the leaves, but actually the central stem, that's yeah. kind of the way to distinguish these from the typical fan. So the stem actually things. emerges out and grows up. Yeah, That it the grows leaves up. are now like attached to. Absolutely. So yeah, what's covered by the bases of these leaves is the stem itself, which you can kind of, because it was the top had been cut off here. How does it continue to grow if the top is cut off? It will then continue to grow from rhizomes that will make new, brand new shoots and make a colony eventually. Okay, so, that, so then that's where it gets cut off. That's as high as it's ever going to go. The, yeah, this specific stem is yeah. done now. It, it, they don't seem, they don't usually make a new branch out, mm -hmm. out of the side. 
Um, but they will make a bunch of new vertical stems, which is kind of like how horsetails grow, which is one of the things that helped me get interested in. Because <laughs> they like the, you know, the plants that can grow as a clonal growth where yep. they can actually clone themselves. And, and they also um, often will tend to stop growing vertically when they flower, because the flower, like this, has a flower stalk here. And so if you cut uh, off the flower, would it continue to grow vertically? No, cause the, hmm. because the, the apical meristem, the, the part that grows new leaves, has turned into a flower stalk. And so whether the flower stalk is allowed to develop or not, it's still kind of a what's called a determinate type of structure, meaning it grows to a certain point and then stops. Got it. Whereas, so, um, you know, I think sometimes that they have, they have different methods to kind of stop that from happening to make the, you know, what makes specimen plants grow taller and taller, that they do that for display plants in, in Asia. So they keep, it, keep them from uh, They do a lot of funny business in Asia to make the plant look a little different. <laughs> oh yeah, they've got lots of interesting techniques for, and also to make them variegated and stuff. Yeah. Like that. So that's a whole art and science in and of itself. But yeah, this is another probably Poelii, but you know, it, it came with a name called, uh, what was it called? Black Wave or something, Somalia Black Wave. Mm. So, because it's very dark, dark leaves. And so yeah, one of the goals of growing all these out here in the garden is so we can start to sort out all these uh, interesting variations. And see. All right, so. So most of our other Sansevieria bed is made up of those kind of more succulent, cylindrical leafed um, Sansevierias, but there are also these really spectacular Sansevierias that are more flat leafed. And this is one of, one of them, Sansevieria scimitariformis, that's um, named after, some of, sometimes their leaves are reminiscent of kind of the curved blades of a scimitar, mm -hmm. but um, this one isn't quite so curvy. And it's another, although sometimes you can see that curve. And uh, once again, it's a it's a huge it's one species, but all sorts of variations. So we have this is more like a, a silvery one, and then we have kind of one that's called the over here. We'll look at a black scimitar, and, mm. then, and then another that's uh, kind of more standard. So there's. Is this where you moved your pencil stick cactus to, <laughs> <laughs> or is this just a different one? These are a different one. Yeah, yeah. this is a these are different stick pencil cacti, which is another uh, love of mine. And this is Sansevieria bitale. It's different, it's got kind of the, more of the roughly margins, a little thinner. Yeah. And, uh, but these are both Sansevierias with the stem underground and all you see is the leaf and the leaf is uh, flattened. And so it's kind of there, all these little tweaks in the form where that whether, you know, if you just make the leaf a little rounder, and if you have the stem extend above ground, you get the fans and these, you get this kind of clump of, of leaves with the underground stem. And this is named after Weary Batala, who was a, another person who collected many of these plants that ended up being described as, as species. So it was named in his honor. And this, there are just countless variations of this species all across Tanzania and I think into Kenya. And it's pretty spectacular when it grows to full size. Mm. And then this is a, a darker leafed scimitar formis that's smaller at this point, but you can see the leaves are, are starting to develop more of the mature upright form. But a lot of these sands of areas, they go through a transition, especially if you grow them from a leaf where they'll have initial juvenile form leaves, which might be more flat, and then eventually the they, they develop more mature type of growth. So when you grow them from leaf cuttings, you, it can take some time to get them. Most, most of the species, you, you have to grow them through this whole transition to get plant that looks like the original. And uh, whereas if you grow them from an offset where, where there's actually a fully formed plantlet that's got roots and a stem, then that will continue to grow in the mature form. So that saves you time and, and sense of areas uh, Time means a lot because they are very slow, most of them. And you know, and that's why Sansevieria breeding is something only certain people do because it takes so much time and so much patience 
to grow a, a Sansevieria from a seed and figure out if it's got new potential as a new cultivar, a new hybrid, and then and then see it through to its to a mature form. So it's. A, yeah, and that makes sense too. Like if you want to actually make a specific selection or variety because they're so slow, oftentimes you'll want to test them over multiple generations. So that increases your time with them. Absolutely, it's yeah. a very takes tremendous patience and dedication to labor of love. Yeah. And then you also have to, you know, some of them don't flower very often. So that then, you know, to just get the right pollination, it's all a matter of timing and. Often, you know, I think they do. They tend to do it at night because the, the the Sansevieria flowers tend to be fragrant at night, and so there are a lot of pictures of Sansevieria breeders with their headlamps at night and doing their pollinations. And this is another silvery scimitariformis here. Let's see, sort of the leaf curvature. I think against um, what is this a Calicia or a Tradescantia? Or? Yeah, it's a Tradescantia or, or Cyanotis or one of yeah, those. Yeah, one of those. It it actually um, translates really well against the silvery leaves and then the deep purple. Absolutely, yeah. It turned out to be a good combination. Mm -hmm. and people often don't think so much of Sansevierias in color, but they do have all these subtle, subtle pa patterns and different colors and. So not, not quite as bold as flower, many flower colors, but. And these are some other, we've kind of concentrated some of the more flat formed and bat form, like yeah. this is a, one of the super pinks here. And also to see how some of these do and maybe a little more shade, they get a little less direct sun in this corner. So. I mean, honestly, they seem to be doing extremely well. <laughs> I don't know. They in are, the shadier they do, parts. They do seem to like it. And then here we can see sort of a, a transition, this one, you know, some of the original leaves right. weren't so happy here, but the new leaves you see are coming out quite nice. And, Pretty strong, yeah. And, you know, just because the old leaves, when you transfer a plant to a new place, may be getting stressed, that doesn't necessarily mean the plant is unhappy. It just means those leaves aren't adapted to those conditions and it needs to grow the new ones that are. So that's, uh, Amazing, look at the, the variegation behind there. That's the first that I'm seeing, like, of a strong variegation at least. Yeah, we haven't done a whole lot with the variegated uh, types here, but this one has got a special potential. This is a, a Masoniana, Sansevieria Masoniana, the, that um, was selected by Barry Yinger, uh, had found it in Thailand and said it was one of the ones with the best yellow variegation. And it turns out to have fairly good vigor. Uh, one thing that's interesting about the, a lot of the variegated Sansevierias are much slower growing than the non-variegated ones, which isn't terribly surprising, but um, sometimes it's so much slower that you know, it can be a, and, and the other thing is that the variegation when you grow the plants from leaves tends not to translate because usually the, usually it's because of the variegation is usually in the, is the, in these streaks and it's usually only cells from one area that make a new bud. So if it's a cell that's from the green parts, you'll just get green. So, right. you, so you can usually get a green plant back from a variegated plant, but uh, it's hard to get a variegated plant from a green plant. And, um, but then if you grow them from offsets, you, you preserve the structure of the variegation because the, each of the offsets has a bud that's a copy of the, of the original plant. So you can, you can divide these. And so this one is nice because it actually grows reasonably fast for a variegated plant. And, uh, and it's got really good variegation. So. And then this is a, Another of the, of the bats here that seems to be really promising, this is called Malawai bat, which might be a form of Sansevieria sinus simiorum, the species that has very, very thick leaves. And this one gets quite tall. And uh, it's got real potential for architecture. You're right, though. After a while, they all start to seem a little similar, especially when you're kind of going through them. But if you look at them closely, you could maybe see some differentiation, you know? Yeah, definitely. And that's, and the other thing is that a lot of them at their earlier stages, like this one has sort of semi immature growth here, that it's a little, a little flatter, a little broader, and then the real more cylindrical leaf is developing. So many of them 
sort of their distinctiveness is less clear until they get to a fairly mature size, and uh, which means a lot of time, you know. So it's a uh, and uh, patience, which is a good a good thing that botanic gardens can do is grow things for a long time and yeah. and document their their progress. But but that's uh, like uh, you know plant groups like anything that people kind of get into and study. Often they'll you know many things will look similar and then if you get into them enough you start to pick out all the all the subtle differences and and, so, and then they sometimes seem even less subtle but it's a you know it's a new way you know it's it's a way of discovering the world you know there's a there's a lot of fascinating detail and variety that that you know our brains are are programmed to to, you know, like like with children, you notice often they will zero in on everything as being brand new because it's a whole new world to them. But uh, you know, we we'd never get out the door if we paid attention to all the wonderful things that are even inside a house or just you know even you know there's there are so many millions of bacteria in the soil here and you know and fungi and there's a you know there's a whole world in just a you know a little teaspoonful of soil and you know we. We can we can study and and uh, and figure that all out, but then you know we we have to uh, do other things in life too. So yeah. I learned a, a remarkable thing about Sansevieria is through some recent storms we had in Florida. Uh, we had a hurricane called Hurricane Ian that that hit the Gulf Coast of Florida, and right after that happens, a couple of uh, important Sansevieria collectors. Um, were able to share their collections with us because they were kind of going to move on to other things, and partly because of the of the storm damage. And one of them um, was Juan Chahinian, who was an important person in the in the Sansevieria Society, and he had moved back to Argentina and, and donated his collection to Naples Botanic Garden. And then shortly after he did that, those collections were actually flooded with salty water from Hurricane Ian in their nursery. And they were underwater for several days, and I would have expected that that they would have suffered tremendously, like any succulent. You'd expect that would kill a lot of succulents, probably a lot of cacti. But the Sansevieria, as it turned out, they did quite well. And similarly with with these here that were from another collector, um, that was kind enough to share them with us. Uh, they had also been flooded this time with fresh water, and were underwater for several days. And remarkably have fared quite well. Uh, are these some of the exact specimens? Or these are just... exact specimens here. Wow. This and this and... And where are these originally this. from? And a lot of these are from Kenya and Somalia. And um, and some of them we're not exactly sure where they're from. This one. So is maybe from... not cold hardy, but water hardy. <laughs> yeah, but remarkably, and, and not only water hardy, but sometimes maybe even salt water hardy. And, it turns out that uh, Sansevieria trifasciata in some parts of Florida has been known to to uh, colonize islands uh, offshore, apparently by floating fragments of the rhizome uh, going from place to place. And there are some some Sansevieria populations known from beach areas in Africa. So it's possible that that they're uh, you know that not only can they tolerate drought, but they can actually tolerate uh, flooding, which is wow. fairly bizarre, at least temporarily. And these plants, uh, when I planted them here, even after they'd been flooded, after, you know, they were probably a couple months since the hurricane, and they had nice new root growth, so they were clearly bouncing back quite well from that stress. So. Well, bouncing back, but it seems like they were completely un unaffected. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Remarkably so. And, and it goes to show, you know, that often the assumptions we make about plants, you know, may not hold up to reality. Often we have to, uh, ask the plants the questions instead of asking our own theories or, or the books even sometimes. So, Very good lessons learned there. Thank you for sharing some Sorry. of that anecdotal uh, discussion points of just like flooding and what happens. It makes me feel bad that if I ever overwatered my Sansevieria, I'd be like, what, what the heck is wrong? I thought you could <laughs> handle the flood. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. Absolutely. Thank you. So what do we have here? Yeah, this is Sansevieria sinusimiorum, another of these uh, giant green bat form with the kind of open spoon at the top of the of the leaves. And uh, 
we grow this in the in our sunnier uh, plot as well, that where it's kind of a little bit more yellow from the exposure. But here, under more shade, it gets really nice and dark. So, which uh, kind of shows off more of that kind of very uniform color that this one has. And uh, one of the virtues of being able to experiment with this whole new group of the garden is we can try it in all these different different lighting exposures and see where they where they look their best. So, when we uh, propagate them and share them with the gardening public, we can give better recommendations of how to make them happy. And then you have this one over here, which has a bit more of that kind of mosaic pattern. I call it yeah. mosaic, but it probably has a different name. Yeah, I think name. this is Sansevieria grandis, uh, or at least one version of that, that uh, looks a little bit like the common Trifasciata, but a little bit wider leaves. And, and uh, this one, is a very fast grower for a Sansevieria, which is nice. So I think this has got real potential for as a landscape plant down here, and I'm sure it's fantastic as a house plant too. And then you have some of these little ones that I commonly see, like in supermarkets and stuff. Yeah, right these here. are these are uh, various cultivars of Sansevieria trifasciata that. Uh, I think this one's one of the honey eye types or something. I'm yeah, not... I think you're right. Yeah, here we go. Let's see. And so, you know, these have been bred to have shorter leaves and more, you know, kind of more and more of a rosette. But it's interesting that one of the, that this is actually, some of these Trifasciata types have a, have a reputation of being a little more um, challenging with diseases down here, which is kind of odd because you'd think that those really succulent ones would, would be more vulnerable to, to problems. But apparently these, it's these, you know, maybe they, you know, were a little, we have too much, you know, it's the extra rainfall or something, but still that's fairly surprising because you'd think the succulent ones would. Well, you keep, uh, I think maybe there. like weak breeding, you know, they selected them for the variegation on the edges, but maybe they didn't select them necessarily for the, their ability to fight off fungus or bacteria, who knows? Most likely, yeah, that's most likely the case. And, uh, but there's, uh, yeah, so many different vari varieties of these that have been bred and, and Sansevierias are, uh, you know, I mean, any plant that gets, the, you know, catches the interest of the gardening public is kind of becomes a palette that, you know, where the art of these breeders can be expressed and, you know, they can select all of these different ones. And they, you know, they often have secret methods they have for how to make, create variegation and, and coveted, you know, stock plants that they can use as a, as a parent. And so there's all of these things go into these different forms that we see in in the stores, yeah. Well, this looks very exciting. I'm glad you're growing them in different uh, conditions here and you could show us like even some of the things that stress them out or the things that, you know, the cold tolerance or the heat and how they actually could still bounce back and also how they might actually vary from growing them in a pot to the outdoors. So I very much appreciate this, Chad, and I'm sure everybody else who watches this will as well because Sansevieria, it's a, it's a favorite houseplant of many. Absolutely, and well-deserved. Whether you call them Sansevieria or Dracaena, we trust this episode helped expand your appreciation for snake plants. If you dug this episode, then go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you're keen on helping the channel out, hit that subscribe button, and the notifications bell will prevent you from missing any episode. Tipping the channel or becoming one of our illustrious sustaining members is always appreciated, as it allows us to reinvest into more great episodes like this. Additionally, you could check out our online houseplant materials and courses, including the 125 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet, Houseplant Basics, Troubleshoot Your Houseplants, and the Houseplant Masterclass. And don't forget that we have a new channel covering outdoor gardening, herbs, permaculture, agroforestry, and homesteading over at Flock Finger Lakes. We'll see you in the next episode.